I'd like to introduce you to lecture nine, on, which covers chapter seven on the axial skeleton. We're going to break the skeleton down into two regions to make this a little more palatable. So remember, when we look at the axial skeleton, it's only going to cover the skull, the rib cage, which some people think is appendicular, but it's not, uh, and the vertebral column. Okay, so, uh, um, so remember, it's going to be the skull, the rib cage or thoracic cage, and, and the vertebral column. Later on, we'll look at the appendicular skeleton, which includes the scapula, clavicle, which some people think is part of the rib cage, and it also includes the uh, pelvic girdle, which some people think is the axial, but it's not, and of course, the lower appendages. So to reiterate, the three major regions of the axial skeleton, which is approximately 80 bones, it's a lot of bones to know. Luckily, a lot of them are duplicates. But that includes the skull, the vertebral column, and the thoracic cage. I'm going to see there's also going to be a little bone where we don't really know where to place it in there, as far as whether it's skull or, or thoracic cage. So here's showing the axial skeleton, all highlighted in blue and basically its extent and its relationship to the um, appendicular skeleton. And this is, of course, an interior view. So let us first start with the skull. And what's very important for you is to understand the difference between cranial bones and facial bones, two sets of distinct bones that actually develop differently in the fetus. So the cranial bone's main job is to form what's called the cranial vault or calvarium. And it also forms what's called the cranial base. That means the attachment um, to where the skull is attached to the vertebral column. So the cranial bones, we're going to see, are very, very specific. And their role is more for protection in the skull and also attachment of the skull to the, um, to the... So when we look at the facial bones, they're going to have a, a definitely different function. They form the framework of the face, which is a, a lot of what we use for recognition and also varies with gender, it varies with age. Um, the facial bones also give us, you know, the ability to recognize family members. I mean, there's a very important aspect of that and varies genetically, you know, uh, ethnically and, um, you know, again, within families. It's also a home uh, for cavities in which our special senses pass through or are located in, particularly for um, sight. We're gonna look at the ocular cavity or optic cavity for taste. We're gonna look at where uh, the oral cavity and then for smell, we're going to look at the nasal cavity. And also, we're going to see that these cavities play a role in air exchange, particularly the nasal cavity and the oral cavity for food. And this is going to be covered a little later when you look at respiratory system and eventually digestive system. And also the facial bones or attachment site for teeth, which is kind of like a secondary type of bone you'll cover later uh, when you get more into um, digestive system. So for the cranial bones, what you need to know, and this would be on a test, specifically ask you what are cranial bones. The frontal bone is the two parietal bones, the occipital bone, the two temporal bones, the sphenoid bone, and the ethmoid bone. These again all formed protective covering around the brain and formed the actual you know, cranial vault. The sphenoid bone we're going to see holds together that vault. The occipital bone, we're going to see, acts as the attachment point between the cranium and the rest of the body. So when we, when, when we look at the separation, there's your cranium, and you'll learn these bones later, frontal, parietal, that's going to be your sphenoid, temporal bone, occipital, and the occipital comes right down to here, okay, and there's your facial bones, there's your mandible, which is one of the only bones that is not actually attached by a suture. It actually is attached by a, um, a, a diarthrosis, a, movable, a large movable joint. There's your maxilla, zygomatic bone. You'll see nasal. And there's a couple of bones internally you won't see uh, in this view. The Because um, I don't, yeah, I can see the lacrimal bones, but um, you won't see the vomer or the ethnoid bone in there, which we'll come back to later. So let us look at some 
different cut views because you will be looking at cut skulls in class and almost Im images of skulls and unfortunately your skulls won't have colors like a lot of these diagrams do but you can pay attention to the sutures as you're looking through this and sometimes the sutures are literally usually a little more distinct on models rather than the pictures so here we can see your frontal bone and this is going to be a very important term for you to know the anterior cranial fossa Fossa just means kind of like a little bowl shape area and this is where you're going to see later the frontal lobe of your brain resides. This is a very distinct region of your brain and then this is going to be your ethmoid bone and this is an area that's going to uh, call the cribriform plate. This is where the nasal pan uh, your olfactory goes through. It means the ability to smell a little chunk of your brain actually dangles through those holes into the nasal passage. This is going to be your sphenoid bone, and it helps to form the sphenoid, I mean the middle uh, cranial fossa. This is where the temporal region of your brain lies, and you can see that this is where hearing, speech, and other areas are. And then there's going to be the posterior fossa right around your occipital bone, and notice those muscle attachments on the occipital bone. You'll see that those are actually pull marks from the outside, pulling those little dents in, in there. Um, this is going to be where our occipital lobe, which perceives um, vision and, and other visual cues, and it interprets sight, but also we're going to see the cerebellum in there, which is associated with balance. And right about here is going to be what's called your frame and magnum, and that's where the brainstem passes through. So be familiar with this. Read this in your book. Look at these uh, perspectives. So now we're looking at your skull from the... Um, frontal view and the bones are nicely colored just for you to be able to study them so let me highlight the cranial bones or the calvarium and we're going to go there actually we're not going inside but actually on the inside we can kind of come down here a little so that's your sphenoid so there's your frontal your parietal which you don't always see in certain people's skulls the um you're going to have your temporal right there, okay, which you sometimes don't see in skulls, particularly narrow-headed skulls. And we can look inside, see your sphenoid. Okay, again, these are all your cranial bones. From the side, what do your cranial bones look like? So we can draw this like that. And, and if that's your occipital. And it comes all the way around and includes that. And this is showing a very nice perspective of these bones. So we can see um, some important features that you need to know. And you're going to have a list of this. You can see what's called the zygomatic arch of the um, temporal bone. And that helps to form uh, an attachment to your facial bones. It's one of the major attachments. And that attaches to what's called the zygomatic so this area is called the zygomatic arch, and it's very much you. It's a very easily damaged area, but also a very important attachment for um, chewing muscles, and also um, uh, some muscles pass underneath this area too. There's your external acoustic or auditory meatus. This is where sound enters the temporal bone, and this little thing here called your styloid process is going to be very important. It's a very important attachment to neck muscles that help to support and move the head. This is one that gets a lot of strain and is responsible for a lot of headaches because the pain is usually found around here, even though it might be a, stra a strain of the neck muscles that go all the way down. And last but not least is your mastoid process. This contains sinuses and particularly causes a lot of problems with children that get uh, air infections, and we'll talk about sinuses a little later and what their function is in the skull. Posterior view. Now we can start seeing some of the sutures of the skull a little nicer here, um, and we'll talk about those a little later, but there's your parietal bones, occipital, and your temporal. Now notice in the occipital, very huge back muscles attached there back and neck muscles and that's responsible for supporting the head and also nodding the head and also using that muscle to help 
uh, um, extend the whole vertebral column. So not only is it involved in attachment points for moving the head, but a whole vertebral column. And this is another point of headaches when you do a lot of lifting because you feel pain in the stretch receptors of this area, what we call the attachment point, because this is what's called the movable joint, okay, or the insertion. So a lot of pain from headaches. Because when this muscle, because the muscle itself doesn't really feel, feel pain, but the attachment points to the skull do. And again, that's a very, it, you know, it, it, you, you sense it as a general headache that you really can't always locate. Here's your inferior aspect of the skull, what we call the external inferior. Okay, and you can see the cranial bones here, nicely outlined. As they stop there, go here, because there's your sphenoid bone. And right about here, so you can see how the sphenoid, they call it the bat bone, because it looks like a bat, at least it's anatomist it did. And that attaches the facial bones to the cranial and attaches the cranial to each other. It's a major attachment. If that thing ever develops a cancer or an abnormal growth or sulfur uh, uh, softening, because I've seen situations with that bone in other animals, that can create a problem where the whole skull can't keep itself in place. There's your zygomatic arch of the temporal. You can see um, not as well the uh, mastoid process right there. Okay, what's very important about this view is you can see the foramen magnum, and you can see the what are called the occipital condyles, the attachment points for the um, skull to the first uh, vertebrae, the first cervical vertebrae. This is a looking down into now the, the inferior part of the skull. They call this a superior view because you're looking down. Again, this is colored so you can see it better. So where is your cranium? Runs here and all the way around. And again, we talked about the fossa. We talked about all of the structures, but what's important here, when you look at the sphenoid bone right here, is what's very important is to pay attention to this structure here called the cella tersica. That means the Turkish saddle, because it looks like a little saddle that Turkish farmers used to ride or Turkish infantrymen used to ride. And um, right in this space is where your hypothesis or your pituitary gland lies. And this area is very subject to overgrowth during um, too much growth hormone or um, other bone growth hormones during development. And then actually swelling of the pituitary could also cause um, the pituitary to crush itself within that hyphocele fossa. So here's your, bo your uh, cranial bones again from the rear view. You can see real nicely again, and here's your sutures. I want you to know the sagittal suture. You have to know the sutures. The lambdoidal suture, which is actually shaped like a little lambda, which is the letter L in Greek. Okay. Now we get to the facial bones. And the facial bones, we have the mandible, the lower jaw, we have two maxillae which are fused, and you're gonna have to name the part of the fusion area called the mental symphysis. It's actually kind of like, in most people it's hard, in children it's very soft and flexible. We have the two zygomatic bones or cheek bones, and remember they're uh, connected to the um, zygomatic arch of the temporal bones, we have two small nasal bones, very thin bones, two lacrimal bones, which are buried in the, uh, op the optic cavity, two pal uh, palatine bones, which are fused together in one. You, you'll see the suture in it. And these are located literally in the nasal cavity. It's hard to see from the exterior. The vomer is gonna be buried away. There's one of them, and then what, and then two, what are called two inferior nasal conchi. I'm going to see these are involved in the, these two, let's get rid of that. These two are involved in forming the nasal septum, okay, with a little help from the palatine bones. So they, and, and the nasal septum splits literally your respiratory system into two, starting in the nose, into two halves. And, and part of that is to help uh, expose as much air as possible to um, those mucous membranes which line that and help to keep air moist coming in. They also help to, that mucous membrane helps to clean the air and, and keep the air warm. So let us look at the uh, frontal aspect again of the facial bones. So we're going to go like here. 
over that and go around now what's important here when you're looking at the facial bones is that you look at the um, there's your lacrimal bone your nasal bones which some people think could be shoved into your skull but actually if you're hitting the nose they shatter the, the frontal bone and the zygomatic protects you from from this getting to the brain even near the ethmoid region um, I want you to pay attention to the zygomatic bone okay your maxillae and there's actually two just that they're fused together in this little suture your mandible and what I want to do is get rid of some of this stuff to show you what's inside that nasal passage because you need to know these so right here so pay attention to your vomer that helps to form the nasal septum and then the ethmoid helps to form the nasal septum and what are called the middle conchi and you don't see the superior conchi the palatine bone is going to be back towards here you won't see it we'll see that from the inside and then there's your little what's called separate bones called your inferior nasal concha so all this area is for warming humidifying and splitting up the air into two spaces okay so it keeps so this is why you want to breathe through your nose it also re uh, removes dirt and particles because it's because these concha and the septa are lined with mucous membrane and again know that your mandible and maxilla you know contain the teeth which are literally bones in themselves that you'll learn more about when we get into digestive system so here's your lateral view of the skull so when we isolate the facial bones come around there come up to there and then there so again know your zygomatic maxilla mandible you can see some of the processes on here there's your ramus the body of your mandible and notice how the zygomatic arch of the temporal bone again fuses to the zygomatic bone there there's your lacrimal bones and you can see some of the ethmoid bone right there now from the bottom view just going notice there's a lot of labels I'm going to tell you what you need to know so you have to know from here recognize the the palatine bone which forms the hard palate okay this helps to support swallowing there's also blood vessels that go through here notice those openings that's where the nasal passages go in and then come right down and meet your throat so this is the connector point which is called the pharynx you'll see a little later okay your vomer let me get another color for that your vomer that forms part of the septum is right here okay that's all still maxilla zygomatic bone sphenoid remember is that's cranial bone but you can still see that and you can see how it attaches to the facial bones now this is looking at your um, mandible alone you can see the temporal mandibular fossil right there the fossa and this is one of the only movable joints we find actually as part of the skull and actually the mandible is not really even a facial bone it's not a skull bone it's related to something called the hyoid the clavicle and the ribs these are all actually flat bones that form so the ribs literally include the mandible in the fetal skeleton but don't worry so much about that but do pay attention to the ramus and recognize this bone and it is two bones together now some people want to know the mental foramen because very important nerves and blood vessels pass through that particularly those involved in dentistry and involved in shingles some of the shingles uh, viruses travel through the nerves that go through there here's a maxilla isolated just to give you an idea of the detail and that it is two separate bones and you can see the nice attachment of the zygomatic process to the zygomatic um, bone now this is a weird view because what we did basically is um, cut the skull down the sagittal suture or sagittal plane 
So this is mid sagittal cut, and we actually have to um, um, remove the vomer, so you can kind of see in here a little. So the vomer's gone because the vomer would normally be around here, okay? Actually, like this, okay? Because then your nasal cartilage is there. So what we see now is a very nice delineated um, uh, lower uh, inferior concha, okay? You can see the ethmoid bone, nasal bone very nicely. You can see parts of the maxilla, and there's your little sphenoid bone. Now pay attention to this. This is very important. Many of these bones have what are called sinuses. That's in your frontal bone. That's your sphenoidal sinus. You found some in the mastoid and in the ethmoid and, and um, bones and some other places. Um, the, uh, in the maxilla, these sinuses, sinuses play many roles. And you'll sometimes read in books all sorts of different explanations. Part of it, we think is it might be a production area for mucus. It might help you with vocalization and sound. Some people believe that it makes the skull lighter weight, but I doubt that very much considering the size of the sinuses compared to the rest of the skull. In aquatic creatures, that might be true in smaller animals, but not necessarily us. Um, sinuses, um, again, can warm the air, we think, be little chambers for keeping warm air. So there's many, many reasons for sinuses, and they do vary in the different animals that are related to us and that do have uh, um, skull sinuses. This is a little close up of the orbit when we look at the facial bones. So the facial bones of the orbit, okay, are going to be right here. And you can see where the optic nerve goes in. Okay, that's where the optic nerve meets the brain and goes into the eye. This is where some major muscle attachments go through to move the eye and also some uh, nerves, uh, cranial nerves for operating the eye and of course lots of blood vessels. So again, you should be able to pick out these bones and know if they're cranial like the frontal bone, nasal like the facial bone, lacrimal, there's your lacrimal bone and there's the tear duct right there where tears run down either into the eye surface or into the nasal passage, which is why you snot up a lot when um, you're crying. Now, the hyoid bone gets specific coverage. It is not actually a bone in the skull. It does not articulate directly with any bone whatsoever. And it just it's called a floating bone in a way. And it's almost like the patella in a way. Sort of like just kind of floats there because the patella really doesn't have a, a true connection to um, the, the um, lower leg bones and the upper leg bone. So um, this bone is just held attached by, I mean, held, it's attached by uh, um, tendons, by muscle attachments. There is no actual ligament. And, what it, and, and when you look at it, it looks like a miniature um, mandible, actually, which is related as far as development goes. So this is part of that mandible hyoid rib clavicle complex. Okay, and don't worry about the parts on there, but it very much just like the mandible has a ramus and a body, and you can see the little point where it used to be two bones. So the adult bone is, uh, skull is what we looked at. The fetal skull is much, much, much more different because it is literally composed of more bones. And actually the adult skull is really the same number of bones. It's just that a lot of the fetal bones fuse together. And a lot of this fusion takes place with the complexity of these bones starting out as various centers of growth that eventually lead into one flat bone intramembranously or to irregular bones either by um, endochondral growth or by intramembranous growth. So the best thing to do is just to look at the fetal skull and get an idea of, you know, how this relates to the adult. So look, you can see the two parietals, but look at the sutures. That's your sagittal, your coronal or frontal. There's your lambdoidal. That's a suture we didn't talk about because there's actually two occipital bones. And, and really, this suture is not really sagittal. This is part of the frontal bone suture. So the sagittal just kind of runs from here in the adult. That's, that's, just, uh, that's actually a frontal suture that in the adult is gone. You can barely see it on the adult skull. Uh, um, so... Here's your parietal, again, frontal. Look at the facial bones, how smooth. 
they are because there's no muscle pulling at the time. Eventually, muscle causes roughness and tugging on these bones to form a lot of the bone features that you learned about. So again, and now what you need to know about the fetal bones are what are called the fontanelles. And there's the anterior and posterior, sometimes called soft spots. And these are actually cartilaginous hypodermis areas that the bone has not formed yet. What this allows is the brain to grow in the young child and have some expansion room. And there are calcification diseases where these fuse before the brain continues growing and this is a horrible condition, uh, almost, almost what we call a, 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 a hypocephaly, in which the, um, the, the brain grows, the skull seems the same size, and the, the brain literally crushes itself into the skull and the baby starts learning, losing all sorts of functions, uh, particularly in the uh, in, in this motor region, the sensory region, they lose the ability to move to determine senses and it really becomes a problem. So just be able particularly to identify the major bones that you see in the adult and also this thing called the anterior fontanelle, which again allows flexibility even when the baby's being pumped out of the reproductive tract. And now we're going to move to the vertebral column. And this is going to be the hardest thing because we have 26 unique vertebrae. That means they all look different, except we can categorize them into cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx. These two are kind of fused together, so we almost treat them like one. Okay, the cervical, we're going to see there's um, three main types. The thoracic vary from upper to lower and so to the lumbar, but not so much as the thoracic. So what you have to be able to do is identify some parts of these vertebral bones and then identify the difference between a cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and of course the sacrum and coccyx. So to begin, let's first look at the vertebral column in general. And I'm not gonna talk about um, so much of diseases of the curvature, but rather you know that there are, we have two main what are called convex curvatures or major curvatures. And why is the vertebral column curve? We'll see when we look at it right now. So this is looking at the anterior, it could also be a posterior view, but it's anterior by looking at the, the sacrum. This better be straight, because what you want is you want equal alignment so that the pressure is equal on those discs. If there's curvature like this from the anterior view, that puts pressure on the discs because it's an uneven pressure where one part of the disc is up, is flat, the other is angled, and that can push those discs out. And for people with scoliosis, that means that type of lateral twisting could be a major problem and lead to, to um, disc slippage and all sorts of things and puts, it puts uneven, tension on the muscles. So what we're interested in is this curvature from the lateral view. Okay, so there's your um, cervical curvature, which goes this way, your thoracic, your lumbar, and then your sacral coccyx curvature. So why is it curved? You're looking at what's called the arch effect. If the vertebral column was straight, well, that's not straight, but you know what I mean and you put a big heavy pressure on this, what would happen is the pressure would build up and build up on each individual one to the sacrum is taking the full strength of that body and would crack and crush. You wouldn't be able to stand. So what happens by adding a curvature, what we do is in a curved spine, the weight now gets distributed in the curve and it allows every bone of those curves to equally take that weight. This is called the arch effect. And this is why in old days, people built arch doorways. It was the strongest structure to, to um, uh, build stone material, you know, to build stone buildings. So the arch is incredibly strong and it actually supports itself. These middle bones being the main support. So the curvature supports the weight of upright walking. We wouldn't need it curved this way if we didn't walk upright. And people that are bedridden, there is a little genetics to this arch, but it's also sometimes this develops more 
as we get along. And what's a problem is when people get older, if they're not careful about the curvature, because posture helps determine this curvature, this curvature sometimes can get to be too much. And we'll kind of blank this out a little. This curvature gets to be too much. And what happens then, the person eventually, the weight of the head pushes down on it. And you see these people, sometimes these elderly people that are walking around with strollers with their head kind of looking almost down. And you don't want this curvature to be too much too. Because that can create problems where this arch now puts uneven distribution now on those bones and tends to cause this arch to become more exaggerated. So the curvature allows for better weight bearing. And this is why posture comes in. And what's funny is the four-legged stance is a very important position for sometimes taking weight off of that curvature. Because animals that have four-legged stance don't have the same degree of curvature. The arch is more focused here rather than a double curve like that. So when we look at individual vertebrae, what do we want to know about them? This is the major question. What do we want to know about them? How do we identify them? So we're going to have to understand the body or centrum. I'll usually ask the body. We're not going to focus so much on the vertebral arch. We are going to pay a lot of attention to the vertebral foramina. Okay. And we're going to pay attention to um, a little about the intervertebral foramina because these are major areas for blood vessels. This is where the spinal cord passes through. But we're going to mostly pay attention to with the um, vertebral arch is um, going to be something called the transverse process. And we'll look at that in a minute. So with each verse, uh, 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 vertebra, we're going to find these processes. And the important ones for us are going to be the spinous, because that's what tells you sometimes what type of vertebra it is. And these are major ones that support the back muscles. So the back muscles that attach the back support attach to the spinous process. And the same is true for the transverse process. This is to be important too, because it helps you to determine what type of vertebra you're in. We're not going to worry about naming these as much as recognizing what they do. This is where verte vertebra attaches to vertebra, top and bottom. They're little protrusions with facets on them. And we'll see these in a minute. So this is a typical vertebra. That means it doesn't really match anything we're going to look at, except this really does resemble a thoracic. And you'll see why a little later, and you'll learn this. So what we see here is a centrum of the body. Now, guys, to give you an idea of what this means, this is where an articular capsule is, right here. This is a covering of, of um, uh, um, dense, irregular connective tissue. Now, this is where your disc would be. That little ear right here, the disc is a double type joint. So it's, it's almost like a, um, a synovial joint that has a little sac in there with fibrous connective tissue. So there's going to be a little other con uh, connective tissue in here. So your disc is a very complex sur surface that fills that little space. And then this area is the attachment point, again, for a capsule, very much like you see uh, covering the knee joint, the elbow joint, and the shoulder joint. OK, so, what, what, so um, when we're looking at bone, this part's going to be important to look at the size, the relative size. Here's what we really need to pay attention to, is this region right here, these transverse process, in particular the spinous process, because this varies from cervical to thoracic to lumbar and helps you to tell the difference. So let us move on. And again, we're going to look at the cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacral coccyx complex. Now, when we look at the cervical, we number the cervical one to seven. These are the smallest and lightest vertebrae. And guys, be careful, because the lower cervical can look like an upper thoracic. So don't go by size, except I won't trick you on that. But they are smaller in relationship per person. We're going to see that uh, C3 through C7 are very similar, very common. C1 and 2 are going to be totally different and not even look like cervical vertebrae. We're going to pay attention to the spinous process because it's going to be what we call bifid. It has a little split. 
and then we're going to pay attention to the very large vertebral foramen. That means the part where the thickest part of the spinal column comes in. And also the thickness of the spinal column is very large compared to the size of these bones. So let's just look at one. And this is your typical C3 to C7. So what to pay attention to here from the top view, very large foramen, your vertebral foramen, these are your little transverse foramen. They pass blood vessels through there. This is where, again, the, uh, of the spinal cord goes to. And guys, look at this. I call this the upside down alien face. So there's ET, there's his eyes, there's his mouth, that's his head, his neck. He's upside down saying, I need to go home. Or it could be an alien head if you watch Close Encounters. So that's how I remember these. Plus the transverse process, that means that little thing right there faces down. It also has a split. These are only bones that have that. So notice the smiley face, and you'll see this as you compare different vertebrae. Now guys, this is only true for vertebrae three through seven. Let us take a look at one and two separately. So this is cervical vertebrae number one. It is also called the atlas because it holds up the skull, just like this guy, this mythical guy called Atlas. Okay, what he did was on his back, okay, he supposedly held the whole world. So it looks like this little bone is holding up this whole skull, this big skull. So it's sometimes called the atlas. In the atlas, you can see these huge articular surfaces, and you're going to have to know that the atlas um, attaches either to the occipital bone or to the second cervical vertebrae. And I'm not going to make you know which is which. There's no, no, the inferior and superior attachment point. But notice that big opening. And notice the eyes. Look at them. This face is spread out. It's a screaming alien. But look at the bone from this perspective. It's just, you don't even see a trans, a, 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 a much of it. Well, you see a transverse process, but you don't see the uh, posterior process there. That is kind of cool. It's gone. Now, with, this with the uh, spinous process here, it's a little smaller. And you'll see that it's bifurcated from the side view. So this is now C2. This is called the axis because this is a rotation point we'll see in a minute. So notice this has no eyes. They're gone because the blood vessels actually travel here. And then they'll eventually go back into those little openings you see in uh, C3 through C7. Nice big foramen, transverse processes, you know, kind of medium. Let's look at the side view. I should say the front and back view, but now you can see the, what's called the dens or the odontoid process, meaning the tooth process. Okay. What you need to know about this is this is where C1 attaches. So C1 attaches here and here. And what the axis does is allows the head to rotate. That means you know, literally go in, not a total circle, that would be crazy, but in a semicircle, one direction or the other. So please know that. And please recognize this bone. We'll see it enough in lab, you should be able to recognize it. And notice the little eyes there. You don't, you, they're kind of hung down there where these blood vessels go through. You didn't see that before, but this is where the blood vessels go through. Now let's look at the thoracic, T1, to T12. They all articulate with each other. They're held up by incredible amount of muscles, particularly by the spinous process and by their transverse processes and directly to them. So when we look at a thoracic, how do you tell this apart? It's bigger than a cervical. There's no face now, no smiley face. Okay, what you see is nice transverse process, nice spinous process. Usually the spinous process is long and points down. Cervicals do that too but the cervicals are smaller and bifurcated. They have that little divot, this does not. Look at the inferior notch. This is where actually you'll learn later spinal nerves and blood vessels come out of. So there's your notch, attachment point to other vertebrae, medium-sized body, smaller vertebral foramen, but here's what you really wanna look at. Okay, is these little holes right here. I should say faucets. That is where rib, attaches to vertebrae. So let me highlight these again. When you start looking at how ribs attach to these, because that's going to be an articulation bone of the thoracic vertebrae. 
our ribs going to attach right here and to that spot here. So we're going to see that the rib, eventually the rib is a curved structure, is going to come around like this, attach there, and then hook down and cover that spinous process. And then the rib above that is going to kind of do the same thing. They're sort of shaped like a banana. And we're going to see this when we look at the rib in more detail in a few more slides. So that's the thoracic, but pay attention again to these unique features, particularly this downward facing narrow spinous process and these attachment points are always going to be found on a transverse process and a little notch on the body. Now we're in the lumbar, five, these are going to be thick bones, very thick, huge wings, huge body, a rather small, and it's not small, it's just small in comparison. The vertebral foramen is actually the same size as the thoracic, but look at the weight of the body. Look at the body. This takes the most weight now of the body. So they're taking the full weight of the body. Okay, of course, it's evenly distributed, but I mean, they still take more weight than the cervical and the thoracic. But they are providing support. Look how thick that is too. And But look at the spinous process. It's stubby. It's nice and stubby. And that's cool. And this is going to be the main feature. So for the lumbar, your main feature is a huge body, tiny little processes, and a big fat spinous process for a lot of muscle attachment to support that back and support that weight. And last but not least is a sacrum and a coccyx. I don't want to tell you too much detail about it, except this is it from its anterior view. Your coccyx could be anywhere from three to five bones. It is attached by a, a ligament very loose ligament so that's your tailbone or your coccyx and just know that nerves pass through here nerves and blood vessels these are all fused and so are these but they're not these two are not fused and this is it from the posterior view so you recognize it here's where the spinal cord goes in and then the remnants of the spinal cord come out of here and eventually it exits from here because there is no spinal cord at least in us in the coccyx and other animals that have a movable tail, it is. So now let us finish up with the uh, thoracic cage. And this is going to be made out of the um, upper the thoracic vertebrae, which we just covered, the sternum and the ribs and their costal cartilages, because these are just as important as the bony structure of the ribs. And what is the function of the thoracic cage? Obviously, protection and support of the um, lungs and also the heart. It helps to support the shoulder girdle and and these are not directly attached understand that um, and also provides attachment sites for many muscles the brace for many types of muscles particularly associated with breathing so what we're going to do now is look at the um, thoracic cage and there's your sternum and we're going to see the sternum is made up of three different types of bones actually three separate bones one called the um, manubrium and then you have the sternum proper and then you have this little process which they draw, draw as cartilage and it's probably a bony type cartilage or a combination of called the xiphoid process that comes from the greek that's why you pronounce that z okay we're going to see that the ribs can be divided into three types of categories what are called the true ribs now watch this now follow this the true ribs why are these called true ribs is because each rib of the true ribs is directly attached to the sternum notice that there's a direct attachment point and this is the last of those attachment points okay these are the major movers of inspiration and expiration so on inspiration what happens is these intercostal muscles here pull these ribs out and the cartilage stretches and that allows inspiration now we look at the false ribs that runs from here to here and they're called force because as they work to they literally work together and then attach literally to the last of the true ribs so they're not directly connected to the sternum they're involved in um a different aspect of breathing and more likely these are associated with protection 
Now, they're involved in the breathing only because the upper ribs are, but these are more protective. And what's funny in other animals like fish and, and certain reptiles, you see these, these uh, false ribs or the more common rib and travel all the way down the animal, including the sternum, traveling all the way down to the abdomen and making a, a, its own abdominal cage too. And then the last of the two ribs are the, the last two ribs are what we call the um, uh, uh, floating ribs. There's a term right there. Okay, the floating ribs. And these are more protective ribs. They're not much involved in the breathing process. So again, your three groups of ribs. And then you have your sternum. This is the bulk of looking at the thoracic. So let us look at an original, uh, a, 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 a single rib attached to the vertebral column. And guys, you're going to have to recognize a rib off the body. I'm not going to ask you what type it is. You have to know at least the head of the rib, which is the attachment point to this fossa right here on the thoracic vertebrae. Notice thoracic vertebrae. Spinous process goes down. Moderate sized body. There's your disc area right there, which you know is actually like three joints together. So recognize the head, the neck. That's your shaft or your body. And understand these are flat bones. They're not long bones. They're flat bones related to uh, um, they're related to the clavicle, the hyoid, and the mandible. So these are flat bones. Okay, but know the rib parts and know the attachment points. When we look at the attachment points, what happens the way a rib works, and I'll show you this in purple, is the the head of the rib that's in green. The, the head of the rib attaches there, just like there, and then the rib kind of curves around a little, okay, and hooks onto there, and then the rib kind of loops around, and there. So on a rib, you can see the actual two attachment points, one for here and one in a transverse process. And to look at this from the bottom, you can see again, and let's see if we can get purple going this time. There we go. You can see where the head of the rib comes in, and then where the base is branched here. And this is a very incredible uh, um, articulation. This allows the rib cage to be expanded, and then it contracts on its own. These ligaments and attachments help to, to pull what calls recoil the rib cage back in place. So when you're breathing out, most of your breathing out is actually doing to the, the ribs compressing and coming back and this joint pulling them back together, but also allowing them to be pulled apart. So on that note, we're done with the axial skeleton.